Ladies and gentlemen, I have been exploring using this YouTube channel called Myth Vision Podcast. The topic of the historical Jesus has been one of the big, big hot button issues that I found is an important question to understand. And for a very long time, I myself was a mythicist. I now find myself thinking there was probably a guy. And so today I'm going to be talking to Professor James F. McGrath. We're going to be talking about this topic of mythicism and the historical Jesus. He's written extensively on this in his blog post in response to works by Richard Carrier and others. You know, I bring the debate from all angles. I like to hear mythicists too. It's not like I don't listen to them. I ask everybody to try and be polite and kind. And if you have any challenging questions or something you think is being missed, feel free to super chat it and we will discuss your questions in Super Chat. All I ask is that you are respectful. Now, we're going to delve into this topic. We'll see where it leads because it can be an endless discussion of ideas, and I'm going to introduce our guest. Dr. James F. McGrath, welcome. How are you? Okay, good. I'm unmuted. Uh, I'm doing just great. Uh, beautiful day here and uh, cycled to campus uh, for the first time. I've done that since before the pandemic. Uh, so. Uh, and I'm going to be on sabbatical, so didn't come in to like do course prep and things like that. Going to be working on a book that uh, is not specifically about the historical Jesus, but is uh, is related. Thank you so much for joining me today. You're literally stepping into the lion's den because <laughs> here we were like, I mean, I myself was a staunch mythicist. I'm not going to say staunch, but I, you know, I listened to all things, but I was like, really, like, come on this is just legend and myth here and we can explain away everything. You know, if you really try hard enough, you could say even the Jewish rabbinic sayings, well, they took those from Hillel or they took those from surrounding, you know, how far do you want to go with this baby? So, um, you know, for the longest, I was like, yeah, like completely wholly invented figure the whole nine. And there were like some simple things I think we'll get into that really made me think, mm, maybe there was just a guy. And the guy was very special to a small group of people. And then it evolved from there. Um, first thing I'd like to do is introduce you to our guests or to our audience. And Dr. James F. McGrath, he's the Clarence L. Goodwin Chair in New Testament Language and Literature at Butler University in Indianapolis, Indiana, USA. He has a diploma in Religious Studies from the University of Cambridge, a BD from University of London, and his PhD from Durham University, right down the street from me. He is the author of John's Apologetic Christology, The Only True God, Theology and Science Fiction, and The Burial of Jesus, as well as with Charles Harborough of Rutgers University, the two-volume Mandean Book of John, Critical Edition, Translation, and Commentary. Also author of numerous articles and a few science fiction short stories and the editor or co-editor editor of several volumes. You blog about religion, and I want to share this so that everybody could see some of your publications as well as your blog. Here are his books on Amazon. You can go down in the description. If you're interested in checking out some of the works, please feel free to. I have that link down below, and I've taken most of his books, if not all of them, and put them into my uh, recommended uh, reading list because we've been delving into Trinitarian concepts and um, what, is the what does the New Testament teach? What is monotheism? I read your article on that, and I was like, okay, we need to talk. <laughs> so please go check that out. Also, he writes at pathos.com. Is this where we can write all your criticisms of uh, mythicism? There's a lot on there. Um, it'd be interesting. I need to go and see. I'm not sure if I've ever traced back to figure out exactly which is like my first post on the subject. But it didn't become a major focus for me until... Uh, some other people with whom I disagreed online uh, decided uh, to make uh, me a major focus of their ire uh, because I didn't agree with them. And uh, things uh, spiraled from there in interesting ways. I can't wait to get into some of this and to learn from you. Um, I, I will say, please support us at Myth Vision Podcast. We not only bring both sides of the debate, which I will hopefully Hopefully I can get someone like Richard Carrier even to respond maybe to some of the things that are said here. Uh, it's too bad we can't have a conversation together on these topics. Maybe one day, um, maybe one day. We'll see. You know, you never know. Things can always happen. People can talk and people can find ways to go, you know, I shouldn't have said these things or I should have 
shouldn't have gotten too worked up or said that or this, whatever. Who knows what we can do? But I don't want it to be derogatory. I've never wanted that. I don't feel this topic should ever go that path. And, um, you know, we shouldn't say people's motives are negative and things like that. So I want us to try and get along, help support us here at Myth Vision, because we want to bring to light all of these topics. If there's one thing I must say up front is we definitely see legend. We definitely see mythology. And the real question is, is it all myth? Is it all legend? Is this guy just a heavenly figure? My question just peaking or getting our feet wet, and I'm going to bring critical questions and super chats for anybody who wants to super chat tough questions. Why are you interested in this topic? What got you into this to begin with? Uh, well, it depends whether the question is the historical figure of Jesus or mythicism, uh, because my interest in myth, um, in the historical figure of Jesus uh, goes back uh, earlier and deeper than my interest in mythicism. In fact, I found my way to uh, learning about mythicism uh, by way of engaging in the historical study of Jesus. Uh, yeah, for me, I uh, came to the study of the Bible, the academic study of the Bible, by way of uh, exploring you know, my own sort of faith tradition and background and things like that, and discovered in the process that a lot of things I thought were sure are not sure. Uh, some things I thought were true are quite likely not true. And <clears throat> found that the academic study of the Bible challenged my assumptions, challenged many of my beliefs. And so it's it's one of those things that, you know, is probably worth mentioning right here. You know, there are people, I've heard people say uh, in the mythicist camp that, you know, well, you know, these Christians are biased, you know, in favor of the existence of Jesus, you know. And, well, sure, I mean, but people who are I don't know who admire Abraham Lincoln uh, are biased in favor of his existence and would, you know, uh, if somebody came up with trying to make a case that he never existed or something like that, would um, probably have an emotional reaction, not just a, a logical one. Uh, not that there wouldn't be some serious logical problems. But uh, the point I'm trying to make, you know, and that's probably the, you know, not a particularly good analogy, but historical study of Jesus and of the Bible didn't bolster my faith, you know, it, uh, it challenged it and forced me to really radically rethink a lot of the things that I assumed and took for granted. Uh, I think that my, you know, I have a, a, a mature worldview that uh, still has room for uh, the spiritual and for Jesus and for other things, uh, but not in anything like the kind of conservative evangelical configuration that got me interested in these things in the first place. And so I don't think it's at all plausible uh, to to say that you know the scholars, you know, I mean conservative scholars who you know, may actually work at institutions that require them to sign a statement of faith, uh, you know, they they can't do what academics in the wider academy consider research, right? Because their conclusions are determined up front, unless they're willing to put their jobs on the line. Right? And I'm fortunate not to have to work at that kind of institution, and so I'm absolutely free to, <clears throat> if I conclude that there was no historical Jesus, not only would I my job be safe at Butler University, right, which is not religiously affiliated. Oh, they'd get some angry letters, right? But uh, they've already gotten some from young earth creationists when I've poked them and uh, challenged them. Uh, but you know, my, you know, I have the freedom to explore ideas and to draw conclusions that are at odds with what religious believers would prefer that I conclude. And so, <clears throat> All this to say that you know, it really doesn't make sense to say that people who have acknowledged that you know, history doesn't provide evidence for uh, the resurrection and have said that you know, there's a development towards you know, Jesus becoming a, a pre-existent divine person. And so that is a later development and not something that actually was Jesus' own view of himself. And all of these things that have forced us to rethink beliefs that we uh, we had as assumptions when we came to the academic study of the Bible, that somehow we're like, okay, but you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a stand. The hill I'm gonna die on is whether he existed, right? Um, doesn't just doesn't make a lot of sense, right? I mean, there's not it's like, you know, okay, he didn't, you know, the the atonement's gone and the incarnation and various other things, but you know, his existence, I'm gonna fight for that. I mean, why? You know, in some ways, I think that mythicism reflects people whose 
pendulum has swung away from that conservative Christianity, and they've allowed it to just naturally swing all the way to the other extreme, right? It's just, I viewed it all as true, and so now I'm going to regard it all as myth. And the reason why historical study has kept my belief that there's a historical figure, even though he's a figure that's often inconvenient to any religious beliefs I might have been inclined, you know, might be inclined to have, <laughs> is precisely that historical study doesn't deal with evidence en masse, right? It looks at each particular piece of evidence. And the truth is that we have lots and lots of figures who are so thoroughly mythologized, so thoroughly surrounded by legend that historians don't feel like they can feel confident about saying much, you know, saying much of anything about them. But they're persuaded they were real figures because you know, the evidence points in that direction. And so when you have a few tidbits that really resist explanation in terms of people just making stuff up and a whole lot of mythology, then that's the appropriate conclusion to draw, right? And if you really have to force the evidence, you know, even if it's only a few pieces in order to get this, you know, get rid of the last little bits of, you know, historical fragments, then, then you're forcing the evidence, right? You're not following the evidence where it leads, which I, following the evidence where it leads doesn't always lead people to the same place, but uh, that should be the ideal, I think. Okay. So there's a lot here. There's so much, right? How do we begin on this topic? Um, obviously the major scholarly proponents of the idea would be Dr. Richard Carrier would be the number one. And he's written on the historicity, which you have read. Um, I'm good friends with all of these people, uh, Robert Price, you know, me and him are friends again, we're talking and everything. Um, there's a bunch of stuff that was going on. Um, but they both are proposing that Jesus was probably a complete mythical person, but this is where it gets really interesting. And I want to bring this out. Um, not all the online mythicists think alike. And if you ask Dr. Richard Carrier, you know, did Jesus exist to Paul? He'd say, yes, like, yes, Paul believed Jesus existed but was an angel or a mm -hmm. heavenly figure. I don't know if like most, um, I think most, most mythicists would say, well, that means technically they didn't exist, of course, because then they're just, you know, we have a worldview that's like, we don't believe angels exist. We don't believe in these things. So it's an imagination in Paul's mind that he does believe Jesus literally existed and was literally created or whatever in heaven. Um, and, uh, you know, was crucified in heaven by demons and all of this stuff that it's all taking place up, up in heaven. Now, I'd like to get into some of the examples that you mentioned that you think are being forced or that are not just letting the text speak for themselves. Is there anything you can think of in particular that really caught your eye that you said, hold on, I, I think this is just stretching credulity and it does not make better sense than the historical model? Yeah, I mean, there are several of them. And I want to say you know, right off the bat that, you know, I mean, Mythicists, you know, there there are certainly mythicists who, uh, at the very least, strongly dislike me. Um, although one who comes to mind uh, seems to seems to talk about everybody who disagrees with him in the same way. And so, whether that's actual dislike or whether that's rhetorical strategy or something else, I don't know. Because uh, I don't know what's inside people's uh, hearts and minds. But my own view of mythicism is that, you know, I I welcome this as part of academic discussion when it's done in the appropriate ways you know, and is published in appropriate places so that it gets feedback and interaction and people think about these things, right? Uh, yeah, I love, you know, interacting with people who disagree with me, right? Those are the people that I learn the most from. And you know, I love un unconventional ideas, right? If I thought I could make a plausible case for mythicism, I probably would uh, just because I love, you know, I, I love science fiction positions, guy. right? I love, you know, finding, you know, quirky new ways of things. I'd I think I said this on the last podcast too. I'd rather be wrong in a really interesting way that sparks interesting thought and discussion and leads other people to get things right uh, and to dare to come up with this wacky possibility than to just say something that seems safe and is, you know, not very original and not very creative. So, I mean, I, I love, I love it. You know, I have great conversations with, uh, Mark Goodacre, you know, I hope that at some point, you know, you know, I think maybe the only reason I haven't, you know, become a Q, you know, rejected the Q hypothesis is that, you know, rejection of Q is now becoming mainstream. And so it seems, you know, like if I keep fighting for the 
the existence of Q, maybe I'll you know still be doing the underdog position a little while as the trends shift. It's hard to tell because the online representatives of uh, Q rejection seem to be stronger than uh, in the academy. The textbooks still seem to reflect that as the consensus. But anyway, so I love I love mythicism as you know as a thing, right? I love any unconventional ideas. But what happens? I mean, I've argued for you know some you know I've made some suggestions and proposed some ideas. And if they don't persuade my peers in the academy, then they don't become the consensus. And it's not, you know, in my view, appropriate for me to go out onto the internet and complain that the reason for people not finding me persuasive is that there's a massive conspiracy against, you know, this, that, or the other. That, uh, that, that I have to interject just to point out, right? So when I was a mythicist, I would have said, well, most of the, your academy peers are Christians. <laughs> And you yourself label yourself a, a, a believer in Jesus or a, a Christ follower. If I could use, I don't know where, and I don't want to put words, but yeah. I think, right. I'm, I'm trying to, do you think this is getting in the way of accepting mythicism as, as an option? Or do you think your peers would just reject it? Cause this evidence is supposedly so overwhelming that mythicism is true. Don't you know, like you're just, you just don't want it to be a fable. So therefore, you know, you're going to lose all your faith. What do you think about that? Well, the histor again, as I said, the historical Jesus doesn't, you know, I mean, the irony is that mythicists often say that, you know, Jesus is this perfect fit to prophecy, and that's, you know, how we know he was invented. And, you know, historical approach to the sources, you know, it's like they're shoehorning him in, right? They're trying to figure out how could he, Jesus of Nazareth be born in Bethlehem? And then they tell contradictory stories, right? Uh, if, if you're starting with, you know, well, the Messiah's got to be from Bethlehem, and so let's invent a story. You know, and it's a conspiracy, then they, I'd hope they would do a better job. Of course, you know, if you have a very negative view that all um, anybody who has any religious viewpoint is irrational and uh, incapable of coherent thought, then you're going to say, well, of course, they're contradicting one another. That's why they're you know religious. But even the great thinkers of the ancient world tended to have religion of some sort, right? Some sort of belief in gods or of something, you know, super, something that would seem supernatural, at least from our perspective. As part of their worldview, right? Uh, pre pre modern, pre scientific people tended to view things in that way, right? The uh, the Epicureans, you know, even the Epicureans, you know, it's it's just that there's chance, and they, you know, anyway, let's not get into Epicureanism now because that'll get us really off on a tangent. But anyway, I was just pointing out, like, do you think yeah. your peers would reject it yeah. just? Because it goes against it. And it sounds like no, because it, this has been my kind of thing. I'm openly biased about being a skeptic. Uh, I don't buy that Jesus rose from the dead. I, I try to find other explanations. People of faith would say, oh, well, I accept it. And, and it is what it is. But I'm reading Jesus and finding what I think looks like a, a kernel of a historical person. And it debunks, in my opinion, the typical understandings of yeah. what we would say about Jesus, the, the, the faith Jesus. So I, I just, I think you're right in approaching the historical Jesus, you're going to really destroy many people's bubbles of belief in Jesus. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah. I mean, for, from my perspective, right. If I were, you know, if I were somehow wanting to damage people's, you know, belief in Jesus, you know, if that were my aim, uh, and to the extent that people reject, you know, mainstream scholarship, uh, sometimes I am, you know, all about bursting their bubbles, uh, but I, not in a, a way that takes any one view, you know, whatever your view, you know, if you're a, a Christian who holds a view that's at odds with the historical evidence or an atheist who holds a view at odds, you know. Uh, so, you know, my bias, I at least try to make it towards history, but I'm aware I have biases. That's part of the, the beauty of, you know, the academic uh, system and way of doing things is that we're part of a conversation that includes people with very different assumptions and worldviews. So, I mean, are there biases in the academy? Yes, but you know, the academia is set up in such a way as to cancel those out, right? And it's when you get people saying that you know the mainstream academy is biased against us, uh, it really just seems like you know being a sore loser and saying you know well they won't accept our view, and so we're going to go and we're going to take our toys and we're going to play on our own, and. That's exactly what, you know, that's what some of the online mythicist discussion has done. But it's it's a, it's an exact parallel to what, you know, evangelical scholars do when they say, well, you know, our views are treated with, 
this kind of hostility and don't get a favorable reception at the main you know, Society of Biblical Literature Conference. And we're going to have our own meeting and we're going to do our own separate thing uh, for people who are Bible believers and share our assumptions and things like that. Uh, skepticism, right, at least self-proclaimed skepticism is found all across the spectrum, right? People who, you know, I mean, I was during my teens, you know, uh, not for very long, but was introduced to young earth creationism and uh, given the impression in a well, you know the context of the the Christianity that I was associated with then that this was something that I ought to adhere to, and so embraced it, and then read stuff that fortunately led me led me away from it. But you know I know that worldview both from the inside and out, and they think they're being skeptical, right? They're being free thinkers in relation to this you know dominant worldview uh, that prevails. People who reject mainstream medicine, right? Um, think of themselves as skeptics. And so I think the key thing that's often missing is treating your own view that you prefer with the same level of skepticism. Right? And that's not something that comes naturally. You know, I'm not going to pretend that that comes naturally to me as a scholar, uh, although I've learned that it's better for me to try to come up with counter arguments to my own ideas before publishing something than to wait for some other people to find the, the holes and the problems. But if nothing else, by participating in this discussion, we are subjecting ourselves to that as others see the things, even the issues, even if we don't. Okay, let's let's get into some examples, because I think yeah. there's a lot of people who are going, well, you're talking about this and that. We're floating ideas out there and the same things could be said about you or whatever, you know, yeah. like to try and argue um, or that you might be trying to equate it with uh, young earth creationism or any of these other theories, which you may think it's completely wrong. But let's get into some examples. What do you yeah. think fails about mythicism and why do you say it doesn't make the most sense comparing it to the historical Jesus model? Yeah. So there are a number of points. You know, I mean, one of them is the overall trajectory of how things develop. Right. I mean, if you reverse things so that you get you put like the Gospel of John first uh, and then, you know, the Gospels with the the you know, miraculous birth story is next and then eventually get to, you know, Mark or something like that. Or and, uh, you know, maybe Luke actually has a, a very human Jesus who is not, uh, you know, is not a, a pre-existent divine figure at all in any sense. Right. Uh, if you re reverse the order of development, then maybe you can come up with sort of a, a, a celestial figure, an invented, you know, spiritual being who then is is turned into a historical figure. And so that uh, phenomenon, you know, sometimes referred to as euhemerism, you know, the, the idea of a divine figure being turned into a human figure. I mean, there are examples of people doing that. It's not clear there are parallels where you'd have somebody who's like, you know, believe in Apollo, but accept that he's a human rather than a divine figure or a, a, a divinity who was actually in flesh, you know, that's not what we see in any of the supposed parallels, right? It's an attempt to explain where some of these stories come from. And the overall trajectory is from you know, Jewish messianism, right? From Jesus being viewed as a figure who is uh, a teacher, an exorcist, about whom uh, you know, his followers, the, the movement around him, they also come to think of him as uh, the awaited Davidic anointed one, right, which means the one who will restore the line of David to the throne, right, and uh, restore the kingdom to Israel. And those are the terms in which he's thought of in our earliest sources. And the expectation, right, sometimes for a figure who, you know, God may have prepared in, you know, in heaven, whether it's an ideal figure or in the mind, existing only in the mind of God or what kind of reality they even thought celestial things things prepared in advance had uh, is, is a bit vague and few if any people subscribe to that sort of worldview today anyway but whoever this figure was going to be however exalted however majestic however powerful was going to be a human person who was descended from David and that's the framework of you know our earliest sources whether it's Paul or the Gospels and so one of the things that I think seems like a stretch, you know, and it, I think even Richard Carrier admits that this is one where he's, you know, going out on the limb at least a little bit, you know, is his, you know, celestial sperm bank where they have, you know, the seed of David so that you can uh, 
then arrange for all of that to happen without it having to take place on Earth. So there's the overall trajectory. There's the Davidic messianism, right? It's not just that they're saying he's a, a messianic figure in some vague sense. They're saying he's the one who's a descendant of David. They then say that he was crucified and saying that, you know, this is the one who's going to restore the kingdom, you know, and the line of David to the throne. And then he doesn't do that in any visible sense. It's not clear why you would invent that, right? And so that's an issue. And there, there are a few other things, right? I mean, even, even when we talk about belief in the resurrection, right, you don't have to subscribe to belief in the resurrection. You don't have to believe that Jesus rose from the dead to be able to consider that what people like Paul believed about resurrection tells us something about who they thought Jesus was, right? And so the fact that Paul talks about Jesus as the first fruit from the dead, and he's talking about resurrection, not in the sense that, you know, God restored a person to life or somebody went down to the underworld and then was raised up from there. Uh, he's talking about the resurrection that the Pharisees and uh, at least some others thought of as the form of afterlife, right? That would, when the kingdom of God dawned, would be there for everyone, right? God would raise the dead, raise human dead. And so Jesus, as the first fruits of the resurrection of the dead, connects him with humanity in that way. Right? And then, you know, born of a woman, right, is one of the things that is mentioned there, which is not saying something fancy like born of a woman and not a man or something like that. It's like human being, right? John, Jesus says there's none greater born of women than John the Baptist. Right. This is something I was going to get into is genomai and getting into what the meaning of that word is and and what does it seem to be implying. That's like one of those technical yeah. words that are used. Genomai, it means manufacturer, creator, you know, to bring into existence, not just birth, but it is commonly used for just birth as well. But in Paul, I hear that it's not the common term he uses supposedly. So it's getting used in Galatians. And they make like, uh, I think Richard Carey makes this point to try and drive that home. Have you done any deep dive on the Ginnamai thing to try and like show I mean, its meaning? I mean, it's, it's one of those words that, you know, is, 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 you know, used a lot, you know, in, in a lot of contexts and, mm -hmm. you know, has a very long entry in a, a Greek lexicon and has a certain amount of you know, flexibility. And so again, sometimes, you know, close attention to words sheds light on things, but some, you know, the attempt to take a word that has, you know, a, a lot of vagueness to it and to say, well, because he uses word, therefore he meant this and not that, um, I think is going to bump up against some problems. I think try, trying to give it a level of specificity that would allow you to say, well, he must not have meant, you know, born of a woman or, you know, descended from David according to the, you know, of the seed of David according to the flesh, in the sense of our flesh or our seed or things mm -hmm. like that uh, just you know, is is not unlike again i think it's a it's, it's a it's a mirror image of you know when evangelicals you know conservative evangelicals will say you know well you know he used this word and you know if we you know look at the greek and then we'll come up with some you know thing related to the etymology that doesn't reflect the way it was used or they will try and find some obscure meaning which lets them draw a conclusion that is not the most natural reading of the text i think there's so much that just reads naturally in terms of Jesus thinking this is a descendant of David who was crucified and whom he believes God raised from the dead in the way that he and other Pharisees expected God would do to all human beings in preparation for the final judgment and full dawn of the kingdom of God. It, that's what it sounds like he's talking about. It, this, well, this is the thing. Like, I, I, I'm very good friends with all of these people, right? I mentioned this. Richard Carey and me hung out for a week with Dennis McDonald in uh, California at their cabin. Oh, it, was, fun. it was a blast. I'll bet. And I want to say this. I know Richard's gone on record on blog, you know, saying things, and he may go overboard in his responses and, like, attack, right, with some of the words. You know, when you're his friend, you don't get that attack. But when you're not his friend or you're being critical, obviously you're going to get it. And I want to say the guy's really, really laid back down to earth. He knows that I think there was a Jesus, but I also have told him, I'm like, I don't, I can't be like certain, but it seems like this to me. And he's never seemed like, oh, like what? You're what? Like he's not. So he's very chill about it. And I wish that if someone's going to be a mythicist, that they would use that kind of attitude. 
But um, I don't, I, you know, I don't want to get lost in that. But I do want to get into some of these super chats because some people might have some interesting questions and want to highlight some things. I want to say, as an atheist, to my audience who's watching this, like that is what I think makes the most sense. What you just described to me makes the most sense. And I think the failed apocalypse, the failure of like the expectations and finding ways to try and make it work, which I think birthed Christian Gnosticism with realized eschatology and other things like that. And also his Christology and all that stuff starts to evolve brings me back to like a basic, you know, normal Jewish peasant guy. You know, when we go backwards, when you start going backwards, you see, a, a devolution, not an evolution. And isn't it more probable, like, is it mythicism trying to say he was this high Christology kind of figure in heaven gets you hemorrhized down to kind of just a, a human to some extent. And then uh, it's, it's kind of a complex thing depending on how you want to view it. But uh, I don't know. Anyway, I'll jump to these super chats. Let's do that. Yeah. Let's do that. And if you if you if you've managed to keep up with that, that's great because they're like flying past so quickly that you know, I haven't been able to. You know. It's all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I Some had, people I talk had... about whether Paul had a high Christology or or not, which is one of the things that needs to be talked about. Yeah, but, you know. Paul's a big one because if you don't get Paul, um, well, first of all, most of the mythicists I talk to, they're not yeah. like they they look at the Gospels, and I'm not saying they won't examine them. I'm just saying. I have encountered this kind of, ah, those are complete fictions. Those are like mm -hmm. mythical writings that we can't trust any historical basis for them. So you have to go to Paul with them if you're trying to get this idea. Yeah. All right, Jason Sobek, I screenshot those from yesterday, my friend. Just <laughs> admit it. Jesus is a solar deity, Acharya S. And then, of course, uh, Greek vocabulary, meaning, significance. I'm not sure. Is this Ginnamai? I'm yeah. not sure. Pith no, Pythia. Pythia. I, I can't yeah. read Greek. So. It's like I don't know why that is coming up in this. Yeah, Acharya S with the uh, you know solar deity and stuff. Um, yeah, uh, even I mean, Richard Carrier like yeah. no. But, even Richard Carrier finds <laughs> it uh, doesn't uh, work. Uh, but yeah, that's you know that's another thing about mythicism, right? Which is that you, you yeah there are some versions of it where you get yeah it was all a. Uh, so like it was it was all astrology but then they decided to turn it into this literal you know narrative uh and there there've been a lot of different you know things that have done that where it's really like you know um you know conservative evangelical preachers allegorizing things it's like this text doesn't say what we want so we're going to say it corresponds to something else and it's really just about that uh yeah uh, i like that they're talking about whether paul had a medium christology yeah, uh, I'm with Bart Ehrman. Uh, I'm on the the terminology of high Christology. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that when Paul says, for instance, in Philippians uh, chapter two, verse six to eleven, you know, that God highly exalted him, gave him the name that is above every name. In other words, bestows the divine name on him, with the implication that he doesn't have it before, right? And you know, makes it so that he is the one who receives, as the one who is God's sort of viceroy and appointed uh, ruler. Uh, receives this universal acclamation that is directed ultimately towards God, right? And so, yeah, he's yeah. That doesn't if you're exalted to the right hand of God and second only to God, yeah, you know, that's not a low Christology unless you are working with right. That's what we talked about when we talked about monotheism. Mm -hmm. uh, unless you are assuming that high Christology means you know divinity, right, uh, and full divinity. Uh, you know, not divine in the sense of divinized and other things. The key question in that passage is whether, you know, when it says that, you know, he was in the form of God, is that saying, like, he had a godlike appearance, right? Or is that saying, you know, he was in very nature of God, right? That that view, that translation, I think reflects a, a bias, right, of some who want to say that Jesus was in his very nature God, Right. Uh, right. So we want to talk about bias, right? Uh, th there certainly is bias in, you know, not just in scholarship, but in Bible translation, right? And you'll see there are places where translators will refrain from changing wording, even though it's not very clear any longer because the English language has changed, because people love it, right? You don't tinker with like Psalm 23 too much, 
And so you keep, I shall not want, even though the meaning of want has changed over time. But I, my own inclination is to see that the main, the main uh, background for that is that Paul is doing a, a, a comparison and contrast with Adam, right? So you are taking that, that James Tabor takes this position mm -hmm. too. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm inclined to do. But I mean, the truth is that even if, you know, first Enoch, right, the, simil the similitudes of Enoch or parables of Enoch seems to depict, you know, the, the, the Messiah that would come as, you know, sort of pre-existing in heaven. But whether that's in the mind of God or, you know, the celestial doppelganger of, you know, what would be a very human Messiah. I mean, there's, there's so many options there. And so he can, you know, exist in this celestial realm where he might be, you know, the heavenly image of God, right? Just like Adam was thought of as the earthly image of God or something like that, and still not be, you know, of the same substance with the Father, right? And so he can, the pre-existent Messiah is an idea that at least some strands of Judaism come up with, um, but it's very hard to date them in relation to Christian origins. And so Paul could have said that Jesus is the, the pre-existent Messiah and had pre-existence in view here, and it wouldn't radically change my reading of it. By the end of this passage, Jesus has been exalted to a higher status than he ever had before. That's the impression that we're given, right? Therefore, God has highly exalted right. him. Like, like, yeah. so yeah. he wasn't highly exalted before, and right. now he is, right. is the point. Right. right, and has bestowed on him the divine name, right? Not right. that he had it, right? Not he gave it back, <laughs> returned it, revealed that he always had it. It's, he bestowed it on him. Okay. Thank you so much for that. Another uh, couple super chats here. Here's on YouTube that Paul's use, <laughs> and I can't read Greek, uh, proves that Jesus was manufactured. So I think that's Genemai, right? Not born. Why do scholars fail to recognize these true facts? <laughs> we'll start with that one, then we'll get to the next one. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> that, no, it just it doesn't, you know, it doesn't work. I mean, you look up Genemai and yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a word that's, you know, used for occurrences. It's not, you know, sort of manufactured rather than made. It's, you know, it's, you know, it's sometimes, right, because genau and, you know, genomai, you know, I mean, take, you know, end up producing some very similar words. Often it's just the double, the double new, right, the double N sound that, you know, distinguishes them. And that's why you have some of the, you know, translation differences between, you know, is, is Jesus described as um, the only begotten? Son, right? The only begotten, or yeah, you know, which would be you know, or one of a kind, right? The only one in his his genus, as we might say in English, right? Which comes from you know the the other sort of root, and so yeah, it it doesn't. I don't think the use of that word proves what uh, what people want to claim. And if you want to pull up, right, if you just look up something like Little and Scott, you know, um, I can see if I can pull it up, but you probably can too. And look up Ginnamai. Um, I wonder if I can screen share. Yeah, you can. I'll pop it up let's, if you. Let's see. It'll... Don't worry. We're almost done with the yesterday's Super Chats and we'll get to today's. <laughs> I am in a room, everybody. I'm in the process of moving. I'm out of my garage. I'm in the room, just letting everybody know. Yeah. So if you hear an or, echo. Yeah. Or I could just put the link in the chat, maybe. Yeah, put the link in the private yeah. chat and I'll um, pop it up. It'd be easier. Yeah. I had it, I had it, it defaults to the private chat. chat. And so, uh, yeah, it, I don't think it, it made all of that hypertext. So they may need to. Oh, copy it. Okay. Hold they on. may need to copy, copy it and paste. Okay. I can so, do that. They can also just search for. Like little and Scott is one of the sort of standard Greek lexicon. I think I got it here. Okay, got yeah. it. So, cool. Let me but, zoom in. Right. Is it's there got, somewhere you want me to specifically focus yeah, it's on? Got, you know, I mean, it's got come into being, to be born, right? It's got, you know, all these different ways that, you know, it's used. It's used of products, right? Amount to, multiplied by, of events take place, come to pass, right? Uh, come into a certain state, become... Right. This is a, a, wor a word. Right. It's like it's like happened. Right. In English or did. Right. It's one of those words that's just you, you can't look it up in a dictionary and find one of its many meanings and then say, you see, they can't possibly have meant you know, like, you know, it's treating 
it's treating ancient language like a code in much the same way that conservative evangelicals do, right? Mm. It's playing the same game instead of doing better with language, right? And so it's just like, I think doing history better actually challenges, you know, I mean, it gives, it gives the atheists more, you know, more, more actual, you know, substantive, you know, you know stuff Arguments. in Right. Well, not only not only that, but I also think rather than just looking at it that way, because that's kind of a I'm an optimist and that's kind of a like a pessimistic way to live life is like go out here and try to just destroy everybody else's toys. Mm -hmm. But like it also uh, allows you to kind of appreciate and understand in a better way. So the conversations are better that you can have and go like, I understand mm -hmm your faith. Like I understand what your literature is saying here. And I'm, I'm trying to get the point yeah. that like, we can, we can find common ground in discussing these matters. And yet at the same time, pick, pick each other apart in some other ways. So, yeah. um, I think, you know, I mean, the example, the analogy I would make is that, you know, somebody who actually embraces all of the conclusions of science, right. Uh, and still has a religious perspective, is, is going to be harder to just dismiss than somebody who rejects evolution and rejects geology and rejects astronomy and rejects, you know, uh, everything that, you know, science concludes, right? There you can just say, okay, this is absolute garbage, right? And when atheists, you know, make their, you know, their sort of, you know, leading argument something that secular historians don't find credible, it, it, it makes it easier to dismiss, you know, what atheists have to say. Um, and so I don't think atheists are doing themselves any favor by adopting a fringe view that is not widely accepted. And, you know, I mean, as a, as a liberal Christian, I, you know, somebody who you know, doesn't believe in like, you know, personal deities and those kinds of things. You know, I disagree with atheists in some ways. I disagree with a lot of Christians in other ways. Um, but yeah, I'm not particularly eager to help atheists win arguments. Uh, no, I get it. But, but, you know, it's, it just seems strange to me, you know, um, and the same is true. I would say the same thing, you know, to, you know, conservative Christians is that if you want to engage in, you know, serious discussion about faith, you know, God, things like that, then embrace science, right? And if you adopt fringe views on science or on other subjects, it's, it's not going to make the thing that is actually really crucial to your faith, which often those things are not, um, or don't need to be, it's it's going to make it easier to dismiss your, your view of things. Thank you so much. Uh, Pocket Locker 86, Jay, he's a double PhD evolutionary scientist. Uh, it's my birthday, and you're talking about Jesus mythicism. God, is that you? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for that super chat yesterday, uh, Jay. I really appreciate it, man. Go subscribe to him. I'm trying to help grow his channel. Jay's a good guy, and he's teaching evolution to kids and all sorts of stuff. He's an academic, of course, and so um, try to get people to start thinking scientific and get get with modern science about things. I wasn't that way 10 years ago. All right, now we're starting with today. Constellation Pegasus, who was this Jesus? Right. And one of the things I've sometimes heard mythicists um, latch on to is say, well, look, there's so much disagreement about who Jesus was. And so that's that's an argument against his having existed. But as you mentioned, right, mythicists don't agree on you know, their their view of. So it was all celestial. It was it was astrological. No, no. You know, Richard Carey disagrees. With, yeah. Well, no. But Paul thought, no, Paul didn't think, you know, it's yeah. so the diversity of views just shows that you know, there are a lot of creative thinkers engaged in something, right? If anyone, if there was any one historical figure who got the level of, you know, academic interest and religious, in, uh, coupled with religious interest that Jesus gets, right? I mean, there are other figures, but I think, you know, sort of historical Moses is in a completely different place. And, you know, so for Judaism, you know, it doesn't come up in quite the same way. Um, in Islam, there isn't the same sort of academic, you know, uh, embrace of historical criticism, you know, among Muslims and things like that. So Jesus kind of is is sort of stands out in a, a lot of ways in terms of the the amount that gets published about him and that has been published. And the short answer is, if you take any figure, and you you are you going to try to publish things about him, right? For as an academic, in order to publish, you've got to try and say something new. And so of course you're going to say, 
you know, well, maybe he was a cynic, you know, or maybe he was this, or maybe he was that, or, and so it's just an indication that, you know, people are, you know, coming up with, with ideas. Uh, but if you look across the scholarship, then you can see that there are, you know, consensuses that emerge, even so. Uh, and the fact that on some points, on some details, there's wide divergence, all that means is that some of the evidence isn't that strong, right, for the authenticity of these things. Or some of the same things that people are persuaded are authentic can be fit together in different ways, right, to form a somewhat different image. And so I think that's all that it, right, I think that's all that it's, it, it's indicative of, right? Uh, so to answer the question, who was this Jesus? I mean, I think he was, I mean, I think there are some sayings that seem authentic that give us a clue, right? At some point, he clearly is directing people's attention to John the Baptist, right? There's no one greater, right? The law and the prophets were up to him, you know, up, up until him. And since then it's all the kingdom of God is dawning. And Jesus is, is there as a promoter of, you know, what John talked about. And I think that as he kind of rises into a position of leadership among at least some of John's followers, right, after John is, is at least removed from the active scene, you know, maybe while he's still in prison, uh, I think John talked about, you know, one who would come after him. And I think Jesus did think that he might be that figure, right? Uh, one saying that seems likely to be authentic is when Jesus talks about, you know, that his apostles that he appointed would sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel, right? Because like Judas too, awkward. It's like, you know, or does, does it go to the 12, but then Judas loses his spot until he gets replaced or things like that. But they, you know, you notice one of the gospels drops it and says, yeah, you'll sit on thrones. Now I won't say 12 thrones because it's, like, you know, uh, then it implies that those 12 that he's talking to right in that moment are going to be the ones on the throne. Is that why and, they also make like an, a kind of trying to cover up an embarrassment and adding in like, well, Jesus knew who it was that was going to betray him from the beginning. Yeah. Like, it's like, yeah, well, he didn't really know. And so these right. authors are seeing Jesus. He can't not, he couldn't have not yeah. known that Judas was right. going to trick or yeah. something. Yeah. You get a lot of that. But when he says that the apostles that he appointed and sent out, like the people he kind of makes his representatives and his inner circle are going to sit on thrones judging the tribes of Israel. That seems to me, at least, to imply that the the one that appointed them, namely Jesus himself, must have an even more elevated position in this kingdom that's going to dawn. And so I think he was somebody who, uh, as part of John's movement, came to see him himself in messianic terms. And you know the the fact that the early Christians had to do so much to try to make sense of this, right? There's a lot of effort put into making sense of you know, why the Messiah would be crucified, right? It doesn't make any kind of natural sense. Uh, mm. it's, it's clear not only that, you know, this was an issue uh, that lends some support to his historicity, but that Jesus didn't say, okay, well, you know, here's a doctrine of atonement and here I'm going to die and it's going to be for sins. And so just get ready because it's all going to, you know, uh, we see Christians looking back and saying, well, he must have known, right? God must have known and doing the kinds of things we see in lots of movements, you know, it's 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 the way that people deal with cognitive dissonance. Hmm. And so all I'd say about who was this Jesus, right, is, you know, that he must have been the kind of figure, right, that, I mean, he made enough of an impact on them that they didn't just say, as people sometimes do, and I'm sure some of his followers did, right, when he was crucified, oh, well, we were wrong, go, let's go home, right? Uh, they had... You know, whether it was dreams or other things that persuaded them that you know God had in fact exalted him beyond death. So one possibility is that he talked about you know the, what was going to happen when the kingdom of God dawned, right? And talked about you know the need to suffer on the way, right? Maybe thinking that God would intervene to save him at the last minute, and then the kingdom of God would dawn or something like that. Uh, maybe thinking that he would die, you know that that was seeing that John had died saw that as a possibility, but believed that the general resurrection would then follow because God, right, indignant about the death of his Messiah would raise him, which would mean everybody else raises. But clearly the clearly the early Christians were not expecting Jesus to rise and the rest of the resurrection not happen, right? And so this has got them 
you know, really like struggling to figure out how to make sense of this. <laughs> thank you. Doc Pleromanot, thank you for the super chat. Does the vagueness of rink raglan, which is one of the topics yeah. I said yeah. I'd like to get your opinion on, scales have the ability to truly address that it's the mythic archetype and it's physiological or sorry, psych psychological mm -hmm. meaning that matters versus the question of historicity of heroes. Hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, the more you get to a mythic archetype, the more it fits just about anything and everything, right? And you know, no, no one figure, you right, you know, unless they're purely invented, you know, fits that. Uh, you know, maybe I'm trying to think whether you know, like George Lucas, you know, going back to you know some of this stuff about you know the, the hero myth type typology and deliberately drawing on it to create a fictional story, came up with somebody who fits you know perfectly, right? Uh, but you know some of these things, right? Uh, his father is a king. That applies to literally everyone for whom like the role of king is, right? When you make it, right? Uh, you know, told nothing of his childhood, that's typical of, you know, ancient figures, right? I mean, people didn't pay a lot of attention to children, you know, when they were children. And then when they're adults, you know, whether it's a historical figure or a mythological figure, people made up stories about their heroic deed, right? I mean, you can see that going all the way through to, you know, George Washington and the cherry tree and things like that, right? People making up stories about the childhood of a figure because by the time somebody becomes a president or a messianic figure, you know, people were not, didn't foresee that all along and preserve the stories, right? Um, which if some of the stories about Jesus were true and were there from the beginning, they would have done, right? I mean, once you have, you know, light overhead and angels singing, it's going to be like, okay, we're going to make careful notes about this kid every step of the way, right? So, you know, marrying a princess, becoming king, you know, of course, you know, does Jesus marry a princess? Well, no, yeah, so there's some that he doesn't fit. Uh, becomes king. Well, the Christians are trying to maintain that he becomes king, even though visibly speaking, in all the ways that one normally becomes a king, he doesn't, right? And that's a difficulty. And so I'm not sure I entirely understood, you know, the, the question about, you know, the, the psychological meaning, you know, that one might find in this. But what I think does need to be said about the, the, the rank, wrangling, you know, uh, typology, and uh, I've written an article about this uh, called uh, Rankled by Wrangling over Rank Wrangling Ranking. Uh, and so I, I like puns. Uh, I gather that Jesus did too. So, you know. Is this, do I just go to the top right? Was it ranking what? I, I'll, let me put that, I'll put that in the, the chat. Okay, well. put that in the chat and I'll make sure that I post, I'll, I'll put it in the comments. So everybody can check it out. Doc, thank you so much for the super chat. Let me get this now. And uh, copy, comments, paste this joker here. Boom. There we go. I'm going to open it and drag it over here too. So. And it's interesting. There are people in there who are saying, you know, Jesus is as real as Thor. I saw one who was saying, you know, it's, you know, it's like, yeah, saying that, the Bible proves that Jesus existed, like, you know, saying that, you know, Batman comics prove that Batman existed or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, there's a common trope. Of course, you can put any figure, you know, and sources about them on one side and a person, you know, from comic books and the other. And of course, you know, they're comic, they're graphic novels about historical figures. So, you know, it's, it's, it's just a rhetorical ploy, right? I mean, you'd have to show that the Bible is like Batman comics. And the truth is that the Bible is this compilation of things that were not scripture when they were written. And when historians are studying them, they couldn't care less that these things eventually, in fact, they're putting out of their minds the extent possible the fact that these things eventually become part of a thing called the Bible, right? They're not interested in Paul's letters as scripture, right? From a historical perspective. They're interested in Paul's letters as letters of Paul. Right. right? And when he sent them to these people, He's not like writing verbose theological treaties to explain to you, well, you know, Jesus was in Galilee. Like he doesn't give you a life story yeah. of Jesus. It's it's occasional letters, right? Yeah. Yeah. And there's nothing, again, there's nothing surprising about that. You know, the complaint that, you know, Paul doesn't say more than saying that, you know, oh, he was born of a woman. He was Jewish, uh, that he you know, was crucified, that, you know, and 
echoing some of his teaching, right, about divorce, you know, about, you know, things related to the Last Supper, uh, is not surprising, right? I mean, he doesn't introduce Jesus, right? He doesn't say, I'm writing to you, and here, let me tell you about a guy named Jesus, right? And so the very fact that he, he's, you know, Paul, an apostle, you know, to the, the, the congregation that is in this particular place, and then the names the place, you know, it's grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, right? He's assuming they know about this Jesus already, right? And so he's he's sending them something. It's not a gospel, right? If he's he's not, you know, as somebody who was not a follower of Jesus during Jesus' public activity, is not poised to write a gospel. And people seem to be complaining, you know, so why didn't Paul write a gospel? It's like, because he thought the world was going to end soon, right? I mean, mm. he wrote letters, right? And... <laughs> Constellation Pegasus Joseph Rutherford accused the Bible students of creature worship about Charles Taze Russell he was becoming bigger than life after his death Rutherford put an end to it not hard to imagine people especially in ancient times becoming deified yeah good point point. and Constellation seriously thank you for that big super chat I will make sure your mansion is beautiful and your lawn in heaven is amazing Thank you. Godless engineer, would you debate Richard Carrier on this topic? <laughs> I think I think I've interacted with Richard Carrier um, enough in writing. And you know, every time you 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 say something critical, uh, you get a, a flurry of of verbiage saying that, you know, I mean, I think he said Morris Casey, you know, is insane and senile. You know, I'm merely incompetent, I think. Um, and somebody on my blog once, you know, um, like took a super, made a super chat of everything that Richard Carrier says about his, like his opponents. And I mean, I prefer not to get into that kind of rhetorical, uh, you know, sparring. I think that these are ideas that should be presented and discussed. And you know, in my writing about this topic, right? Like, for instance, some of the review articles that that one about the Rang Ranglin is just is one of several uh, articles I wrote for Bible interpretation, uh, trying to make some things available online, since that's the place where sort of mythicism lives and flourishes for the most part. And, you know, I think that's the way to do this is to to discuss the ideas. And my reason for discussing these ideas is because I think it's important to get to get history right. Um, I'm genuinely interested, and you know, even though my my religious views, you know, I don't hold the religious views that led me to uh, start studying this in the first place. But you know, I find, you know, I mean, when people ask me, you know, why are you still a Christian? You know, it's it's largely like, you know, well, you know, why are you still an American when you know you don't, you know, you didn't like the, the previous uh, the previous administration. And there are lots of people who seem to prefer, you know, um, you know, well, just see, it seemed to have different views that uh, don't um, value life in the way that I think it should be valued, you know, um, and probably people across the aisle would say the same thing, but, you know, it's, you know, one side saying it about guns and the other saying it about abortion and things like that. Right. But I mean, the truth is, I think, you know, I'd rather be part of a a discussion about what this tradition means rather than pretend that I can, you know, free myself from all these assumptions and come up with a completely new set of like symbols and ways of talking about things. Right. Uh, if I were to leave the United States and go somewhere else, I mean, I lived in Romania for three years, right. My wife is Romanian. I taught there for a few years and yeah, nothing, there's nothing will, will make you aware of your own culture more than going and living in another one, you know? And so, you know, it's, I, I can't escape my heritage and the things that have shaped me. And so I've decided to work within them rather than jettison them. And if I were to become, you know, if I were to finally, you know, if I were to find that some evidence led me to think that, you know, Judaism or pantheism or atheism or Gnosticism or something else was a better, you know, better label, uh, I'd just be an annoying you know, troublemaker in that context rather than in the one that I'm in. And so you're just, you're just that role stay here. a troublemaker, right? right? Yeah. Um, so to answer the question, you're not interested in like a verbal 
uh, debate or video debate, but writing wise, if there was a way to censor and make sure that there weren't derogatory words in the sense, but just purely dealing with the data, would that be something you might I, do? I mean, I'm interested. What I'd really be interested in is, you know, for, for Carrier to publish things in, you know, uh, academic journals. And then it's very common for, you know, another academic to write an article that responds and evaluates, right? I'd love for Richard Carrier to, you know, publish those kinds of things, right? Which I think the editors of those journals will give him pushback if he tries to include some of the kinds of rhetoric that he puts on his blog, right? And if I tried to do it, I would get it too, right? And so, you know, I, th I think what I'd really be interested in is, you know, close, careful analysis of ideas, right? I mean, I disagreed, you know, I, I got a, a fairly negative review of my book on monotheism, you know, by uh, Larry Hurtado, you know, just very critical. And, and because he blogged uh, before he, he died and I blogged, you know, actually took the time to, you know, he shared a link to it on his blog. And so I asked him some questions and we actually realized that, you know, we had, we shared more in common than we thought. Uh, we clarified where our disagreements were. And, you know, he's a scholar, you know, that I, I respect greatly. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, he was the external examiner, my, um, my, uh, my viva, you know, my examination for my doctorate. And so, yeah, well, maybe, maybe we can work. Some, maybe we can walk on water. Who knows? Thank you. Godless engineer, <laughs> Christian, Michael, thank you for the super chat. Please reflect on Genesis 21, two through four. Alex X, the Greek, as background for Galatians 4, 4 through 5, born at the set time and circumcised as commanded by God. So maybe I need to pull this up. What is it? Genesis 21. What is the pericope? 2 to 4. So, okay. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age. At the time of which God had spoken to him, Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son, Isaac, when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure that there are, you know, very strong verbal parallels, right, to the Galatians passage, right? Uh you know, that, not that he was, you know, I mean, it's that he was born at the set time, you know, the appropriate time in history. Like, this is when God is going to wrap up history. Uh, the end is near, right? That's the assumption. Uh, not that, you know, he was born and then circumcised at the um, appropriate time. But, you know, I think, you know, for Paul, right, you know, Jesus was circumcised. You know, Jesus was born under the law. And that's why Paul has his work cut out for him, Right. The clear teaching of Genesis is that, you know, anyone who's going to be, you know, part of Abraham's household has to be circumcised, right? Includes slaves, right? People bought with your money, it says, right, in the covenant. And anyone who's not circumcised will be cut off from his people. And so Paul has a real uphill struggle trying to make the case that Gentiles can be part of Abraham's family, which is what he's saying, right? They're full members of Abraham's family. And yet not circumcised, right? They can be uncircumcised. And so that's just, you know, one example of, you know, where Paul's arguing uphill. And he doesn't he sort of appeal to Jesus because Jesus didn't, you know, Jesus was born under the law, the way Paul puts it. Right, right. And so, but Jesus was born under the law and has opened the door for Gentiles to be welcomed, right? Apart from law in this, you know, interesting way that a lot of Paul's contemporaries in the you know in the christian movement uh did not find persuasive right and that makes me want to ask questions but anyway uh rob atheist scriptures ig thank you for the super chat just mentioned several messianic candidates around the time area theaters the egyptians simon judas the galilean is it significant for historicity that jesus was not one of them yeah i mean my own hunch i think i may have mentioned this in a discussion is that you know some of those other figures may also have emerged from around uh the circles around john the baptist and may have thought you know that may be why they're such similar figures but there's clearly been christian tampering with the the version of the uh testimonium flavianum as it's known right the passage that refers to josephus and so you know whether it's that you know i mean he doesn't mention you know jesus 
together with them because he mentioned him in another context? You know, is it that, you know, Christian scribes, you know, did some moving of stuff around as well in order to uh, distance Jesus from other figures that were comparable? Uh, there's some debate about whether what Josephus said there was, you know, more negative or just sort of neutral about Jesus. Uh, what's interesting, though, is that we have this uh, this Arabic author, uh, Arabic Christian author uh, known as Agapius, who quotes, it seems to be a paraphrase, right? It seems like he's quoting from memory, but he he provides a paraphrase, right, or a quotation from memory of what Josephus says about Jesus. And it's pretty much what scholars had already come up with, right, uh, based on the Greek text, but trying to remove the Christian editions, right? And so the, you know, the, 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 the things that are obviously reflecting a Christian view of Jesus aren't there. And there's no reason why a Christian an author writing in Arabic would drop precisely those things that are most Christian sounding, right? And so it seems as though Agapius knew a, a version of Josephus that, you know, actually had what uh, scholars, something like what scholars have attempted to reconstruct that lies behind the tampered version. So it does seem that uh, Josephus mentioned uh, Jesus there. Uh, there's also Josephus' reference to uh, James, the brother of Jesus called Christ, right? Which, you know, again, some mythicists say, well, that's that's added as well. But, you yeah, uh, that's harder to, you know. Well, there's, there, isn't, there isn't strong evidence either way, really, mm -hmm. in that one. Thank you so much, Rob. Hunter Biden's laptops. Thank you for the super chat. What a funny name. Dr. McGrath, thank you. Mentioned being a liberal Christian who doesn't believe in a personal God. Would he say more about that? Thanks for the shout out. Yeah. So my view is uh, very much akin to uh, that which uh, theologians like Paul Tillich have argued, um, articulated. And it's, uh, it's, you know, essentially the view, right, it's uh, a technical term that sometimes stuck on it as a label is panentheism, right, where you know, Paul Tillich wrote about God as being itself, right? If God is a being, right, like one very powerful being among others, then that's, you know, that's a, a being that's part of reality, right? Uh, that's not all-encompassing. That's not all ultimate. That's not infinite. And so, you know, for me, I think the appropriate way to talk about God is as the ultimate, the infinite, the, whatever is before all things and is, you know, simply there. And, you know, I think ultimately, right, one thing that atheists, agnostics, uh, liberal Christians like me can, I think, all agree on uh, is much the same thing that you get agreement on towards the end of, you know, David Hume's famous, right, Dialogues Concerning Natural religion, you know, across these different viewpoints, is that, you know, something must simply exist. And whatever that is that simply exists gave rise to uh, what we see and a lot that we don't see and to beings like us that can have these discussions and wonder, you know, well, where did it all come from and what's ultimate and things like that. And there's no way that language can do justice to that which is ultimate. And so I, you know, stick with Christian language largely because I'm using language symbolically. You know, I don't think any other sort of language is, is, is appropriate in that context. And that's why, for me, the existence of God isn't even a, an issue, right? I mean, if you make the case that, you know, the attributes of the ultimate are different, well, that's the attributes, right? It's not existence. And everybody's debating the attributes of God. So that's, you know, that's, you know by all means, let's do that. Uh, and some people would say, well, you know, isn't that, you know, I mean, basically, you know, if it's, you know, gets kind of vague like that, isn't that more like pantheism? It's like, okay, you know, I've sometimes said that if the universe is what simply exists, then I'm at least a pantheist, right? But I'm not sure that's where reality ends, right? Maybe there's a multiverse, but then is there a multiverse making mechanism or is there, you know, an eternal multiverse or, you know, I don't know, right? And that's why I use symbols and, you know, uh, metaphors and things like that. But, you know, Richard Dawkins famously said that, you know, pantheism is just sexed up atheism. And my comment on that was, you know, well, if you have a choice between atheism and sexed up atheism, why wouldn't you choose the sexed up version? You know, right, 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 I mean, right, what's right. that about? Right. Um, I think the difference is that, you know, pantheists, uh, people who would use that label, you know, like people like Albert Einstein, right, will talk about God and like, 
you know, use language symbolically to talk about some of these mysteries um, in a way that I think so, some atheists today, at least, are not uh, not as comfortable. Uh, but that's that's really what I'm re was referring to. Hopefully, that's enough for uh, Hunter Biden and his laptops. Yes, those laptops. Thank you so much for that super chat, my friend. Caleb Aurelian says he is not God, so why why does it matter if he was real? I think this is more of a question towards. Well, I mean, it, you, yeah. it's obviously a question, to you, but it, yeah. I feel like this is a question directed at me as a host, like Derek. You were a mythicist. You first, you were a Christian. You believed Jesus was God in the flesh and Trinitarian, mm -hmm. the whole nine. Then you became a mythicist, and then you went back to thinking there's a guy. Why does this all matter? What's the point? Yeah. You know, a lot of people are like, why is this a big deal? I just want to understand what how this came to be. Yeah. I want to be factual. And I think because there's so many people who believe it, number one, it's an important topic to discuss. There's so many people who believe it. There's so many people who are ready to engage against Christians mm -hmm. and some of the fundamentalist stuff that's out there. And they want to get people to wake up. And I feel like if I'm going to approach it, I want to be accurate. And I want to be yeah. as accurate as I possibly can on what is the case and what is the strongest case for what makes the most sense. And what, what has less ad hoc, assumptions i think for me would be the easiest one to accept but anyway what are your what, what's your response yeah i mean i i want to get history right right and ultimately you know my view is that you know we're all prone to deceive ourselves and so i want to you know expose myself to the evidence i want to expose myself to counter views and you know other arguments and want to think critically about these things and base my view of things on evidence and not affirm things, right? I mean, I'll, I'll use, you know, poetry and symbolism, you know, to talk about mystery. But when it comes to history, right, then I want to get the history right and do what we can based on the evidence. I think that rejecting the evidence, right, even if it's just a few pieces, right, of evidence that point in another direction, uh, it's that's dangerous territory. Right, because the same kinds of tools that are used to, you know, deny historical Jesus, you know, you, you apply them in a slightly different way, but it's basically the same kinds of you know tools, and you know, deny the Holocaust and use them in the service of anti-Semitism, or use them in you know arguing against evolution, or use them to claim that you know there's you know child trafficking in a pizzeria and you know weird stuff that people seem to be inclined to believe in certain circles. And so, yeah, there it's always possible to, to weave a counter narrative, right? And it takes real, you know, careful investigation to keep ourselves from being deceived, right? And I think that's precisely why I think that, you know, atheists who are reacting against, you know, Christianity ought to take a cl close critical look at mythicism and not just do the same kind of thing, right? Uh, but swinging to the opposite, uh, just to a different sort of, you know, fundamentalism or different sort of dogmatism. Mm -hmm. So that's that's why it's important to me. Thank you, Caleb. RN says, what do liberal Christians not believe? <laughs> yeah, I mean, a, a lot of the, a lot of the views, the skepticism, you know, the historical criticism. I mean, that was developed, you know, and a lot of people think that these things you know, are atheist arguments, uh, partly because, you know, they're popular among atheists, understandably. But it was you know, liberal Christians who developed a lot of these tools, who questioned the divinity of Jesus, right? Uh, it was a natural continuation of you know, what the Protestant Reformation did in relation to the authority of the church. Well, when you realize that the church you know, sort of assembled the Bible and assembled the, you know, came up with the creeds, then you keep pushing to get you know, beyond that. And you get the, the sort of more radical Protestant Reformation that's trying to get back to, to Jesus, right? Sort of. Uh, before that. And liberal Christianity just said, you know, there are these tools of history, which can get us back, you know, behind the Gospels to look at history. And ouch, it hurts sometimes because it's it's uh, challenging some of our assumptions about Jesus and things like that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jason Sobek, Lord of the Four Corners. Thoughts on Lucian's Alexander, the false prophet? Uh, no, don't really have any to share. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just getting them here, Jason. Don't, don't, don't be mad at me, man. Don't be mad at me. Actually, he told me he likes it when some scholars are like, 
like jabbing back at his questions or critical of what he says. So anyway, um, thank you for the super chat. I'm scrolling down yeah. here. Not, I mean, I'm not sure I have anything, you know, it's a tech, um, you know, yeah, I, I can understand why he's, why he's asking, but you know, I don't, you know, I've not worked on that enough to feel like I'm going to make a useful, you know, point to point kind of comparison and contrast and stuff like that. Okay. David Bennett, thank you for the super chat. He says never super chatted. Oops. Meant to ask. What do you take from Carrier and Latastor's critiques of your view on this question? Yeah, um, I mean, I certainly think that it's important you know, that as scholars, that when we're talking about history, we not respond to the 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 denials of history with kind of an e equal but opposite dogmatism, right? Um, it's possible to be dogmatic about you know the conclusions of science in ways that actually uh reflect you know uh, uh de deferring to authority rather than you know sort of following the evidence where it leads now to some extent i think that's actually appropriate right because the average person is not going to research biology and paleontology and things they're not going to research ancient history the way that um, people who are professionals in this field do and so you know, one of the things that we're learning in our era is that we need to trust experts, right? And I'm dependent on a whole bunch of people who do more with the Dead Sea Scrolls or with the Nag Hammadi texts than I do, you know, in my own little area. But yeah, seeing that question, you know, what have I what have I learned from them? It's that, you know, I really do want to try to couch things carefully, right? In a way that's, you know, first of all, I don't want to emulate the kind of rhetoric that I've seen from Carrier and Latastor, because I, I think I'm, I'm interested in discussing these ideas, uh, not because it's crucial to my worldview, uh, but because I think it's an important scholarly question, but I think it's important that it be approached using the appropriate tools. And I wanna have that kind of discussion about it, right? Not just one that's like, you know, well, let's see how many people I can persuade on the internet, right? Who, you know, will just judge based on, you know, who gets in the best, jabs and not, you know, actually who knows the the actual sources in the original languages best or those kinds of things, or who's doing justice, best justice to them in discussion of this particular word. Uh, but yeah, I think that it doesn't, hasn't helped things when some scholars have spoken generally that it's like, yeah, you know, it's certain, right, that Jesus existed, right? It's very, very likely based on the evidence, right? I think that similar kinds of evidence leads us to conclude that people were historical, right? And we may not know much about them that we can say with confidence, but the impression we get from the sources is that it points to them being historical. And that is a judgment about probability, right? It is not a statement of absolute certainty. Historical study doesn't give you absolute certainty. And it could always be the case that some better argument will be brought up that will change my mind, right? Or some new piece of evidence will be found that will cause us to reconfigure things. And so the conclusions of history are provisional. And that's precisely why the actual study of history in the mainstream sense is, is so challenging to Christian faith, which wants to say, yeah, well, you know, we're focused on this Jesus figure. So what was he like? Well, we can say a couple of things with certainty, and then it's kind of vague, right? And even if historians could, I don't think they can, and certainly not appropriately, but if historians could talk about the resurrection, right, and say something about it, and followed the evidence and thought that the evidence pointed to it, the best case scenario for history would be to say, you know, Jesus probably rose from the dead, right? I mean, what kind of gospel is that to go around proclaiming? Jesus probably rose from the dead. You know, it's like, it sounds, mm -hmm. sounds ridiculous when you put it in those terms. So, I mean, I think that what I've learned most is you know, to try to just couch things as carefully as possible, you know, to pay close attention to the detail. Uh, you know, there have been times when, you know, I mean, there was a time when you know, I thought that, um, you know, Richard Carrier was referring to, uh, I think, I, I can't remember, we're talking about the, the Targumim, right, the Targum, these Aramaic paraphrases of um, the Hebrew Bible, and he mentioned something, and my mind went to, I can't remember if it was, my mind went to uh, Targum Pseudo Jonathan when he referred to Targum Jonathan, or if I went, you know, did the reverse because it was, it's been like, yeah, you know, more than a decade since I had that conversation. But yeah, you know, I was thinking of the wrong source. And so I said something about it that was incorrect. 
And you know, he challenged me on it. And I was like, yeah, no, I'm wrong, right? Scholars are not infallible, right? That's why this collective endeavor of academic study of history is so important, right? Because none of us gets everything right, right? And history is ultimately, right? It's like a, a courtroom drama, right? Where you're, you've got the evidence and then you're trying to decide, right? And you have a, a jury and they're fallible, right? But hopefully biases get sort of ironed out in the mix and the shortcomings of perspective of any one member of the jury uh, is compensated for by others. Well put, well put, well put. A couple more here, and then I got a couple questions, if you don't mind. Abel Chavez, energy exists equals fact, therefore reincarnation more plausible than resurrection. Even creation didn't start full-blown God or universe sounds right to me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm pretty agnostic about things like life after death and stuff like that. Um, I think that, you know, American Christianity is is like way way too focused on on mm. that in a way that is um, you know really unhealthy and un unhelpful, and so yeah. I'd advocate that people like leave that up to leave that up to God, right? And you know. yeah, I was in that bubble myself. Yeah. I don't know if you came out of fundamentalism, but yeah, I was really bad off. But Abel, thank you for the super chat, my friend. David Bennett, excellent answer, loving it. David, yeah. you're learning how to super chat. You're learning how to see. Trump's nuke docs. What does Dr. McGrath think about the Shroud of Turin? Uh, it seems as though you know, the you know, the the testing of you know a little fragment of it suggests that it is not the burial shroud of Jesus. Uh, I know that there have been attempts by diehard believers to suggest that, you know, well, you know, maybe they touched that a lot and it was you know affected chemically and stuff like that. But it it doesn't seem as though. You know, there's any reason to think that it is an image created by you know the the radiation produced when you know a body dematerializes and other things that I've heard that people think. So not inclined <laughs> to think it is an authentic um, thing. Uh, yeah, I have, I have yeah. some you know I have some thoughts about the burial of Jesus. Actually, the, my one attempt at um, sort of self-publishing something was um, made a little you know book uh, called the Burial of Jesus, where I it really was me just trying to get into print when I had a bit of time and something that and um, had not yet figured out how to get into uh, sort of trade publishing for a general audience, uh, do something general about, you know, what it's like to, as a person who comes from this kind of religious background to really wrestle with, you know, the challenges that history brings to, you know, the study, academic study of Jesus. I, I, I'd like to point out something here. Robert Buell, for example, and I take it and kind of giggle just the way that the the tribalism still works, no matter what community. I mean, you could be an atheist and come down to naturalism and think, you know, hey, we're, we're you know, we're, we're primates, but we're going to rise above that. We're supposed to evolve and supposed to show that we're not superstitious and backwards. But like these ideas of like Richard Carey would mop the floor with him and would not be pretty and things like that. He, Richard is a great debater. Absolutely. He's a rhetorician. He's great at debating. And I'm I, like, I would not want to debate him if I thought I was right on something. Like if I really knew I was right on something, and let's just say Richard took a position that wasn't, I wouldn't want to debate him just because like he's a debater. You know what I mean? Um, but my point is, is like this, this, this idea of mopping floors and competition yeah. and stuff yeah. like that. What do you think yeah. about that? What do you think about? Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, I mean, people, anyone who is listening to this, who did that, right, for, but from the perspective, you know, at one point earlier in their lives of Christian fundamentalism, right, you know, Ken Ham would wipe the floor with, you know, whoever, or whatever it is, right, yeah. you know, this is just the mirror image of that, and it has the, you know, it, it makes it hard for a person to follow the evidence where it leads, right? yeah, and so there's that risk, but, you know, as somebody who publishes in academic journals and who tries to do serious scholarship uh but also as a a person who's you know admits he's shaped by you know some christian values of humility and things like that as well you know i'll put all that right there on the table uh, since it's already been it's already come up in the discussion so far uh i i don't want to mop the floor with anyone right there are scholars that i think are wrong i do not want to mop the floor with them and i don't i i want the discussion to be pretty in to, in to the extent that an academic discussion can be pretty, 
right? I want what everyone says to lead to a better understanding of history or better understanding of literature or whatever it is that we are trying to accomplish. I am so a fan of that. And I, th you know, I honestly think that Carrier is as well. I mean, I can't say he's always, you know, we all get a, when we feel like someone's uh, wrong about something, or maybe we get uh, our panties in a wad, it happens, you know, we all do. But um, I think so too, my conversations with him. And I think, I think if we approach this not as a debate, but as conversations, we this is what I do on Myth Vision. When I do debates, they're almost just academic conversations, never getting riled up and emotional. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think when we're like siding with something because we like the idea, I don't know. I threw this out there. I may be reading the minds of some, but I have had comments from Mythicist and my recent one with Dennis McDonald that came out. There are so many people that came in the chat. It's just a, uh, you know, what show in the comment section. Yeah. But it almost sounds to me as, as an atheist. I, I pigeonhole myself. I, you know my ontology, okay? Mm -hmm. It sounds to me that if there was a guy, like I'm trying to get them to see like, you can say there's a guy and it would not mean you somehow need to repent or like you feel like somehow mm -hmm. this guy walked on water or he rose from the dead. Yeah. And it sounds psychologically sometimes satisfying to mythicists that there isn't a guy. And I could prove he's a phony like all other gods. He's just like Zeus. He's like this. He's like, and they not talking about the academic ones, but in particular, a lot of those that are internet mythicists that I've bumped into. And trust me, for those mythicists out there that feel like this is them, it's probably not you, but I'm trying to be fair here. Remember, I get thousands and thousands and thousands of comments in my videos, underneath my videos. So you're not probably getting emails from people harassing you about how ridiculous and stupid I am because I think there was a guy. I get these harassing emails. Mm -hmm. I feel like if there was a guy and I tell them that, they have a, a, a life crisis almost. Like, like, what am I gonna do if there was a guy? And it, it, that's how some of, the, I am not speaking a majority of them, some of them, like a fundamentalist Christian, if you started telling them that, hey, by the way, the earth was not created 7,000 years ago. And by the way, we evolved or something like that. Yeah. They literally believe they're going to go to hell if they believe that. So they can't believe it. I wonder if there's something reversing on the other spectrum. And that's an honest question of mine. Do they think this? Are they afraid? What are they yeah. afraid of? They're giving yeah. an inch to the Christians because there was a guy? I, I don't get it. Yeah. And I, I don't either. I mean, a, a guy who, you know, thinks he's the Messiah and dies, you know, it's, you know, which seems to disprove it. And then his followers managed to come up with a way of saying, well, he was, and here's what happened. And, you know, that's, you know, I mean, that's not more conducive to, you know, uh, the, certainly not to conservative Christian faith, you know, and maybe not to any, right? Um, whether, whether anyone would end up as a, a liberal Christian you know, without coming by way of conservative Christianity is, you know, an interesting question. I can only talk about my own experience, you know. Uh, but, you know, I think, you know, I mean, I certainly do think there's there's power in these ideas, you know, the idea of a crucified Messiah, right? Somebody who um, humbles himself, right? Rather than conquering uh, is, you know, it's, it's a powerful idea. And it would be a powerful idea even if it's not based in history, right? Uh, it'd be a powerful idea if Paul came up with it or somebody else came up with it and it doesn't go back to Jesus, right? And I'm interested in figuring out where it comes from, right? Because you know, I found that idea to be powerful and challenging to me, right? To try to be a a, a humble person and to um, approach approach disagreement in a manner other than you know floor wiping and um, things like that. So, yeah, uh, I, I I don't see why you know I don't see why people would prefer you know to say it other than that it's it's simpler to say it's all lies right it's all fairy tales it's all made up right it's simple right, right? whereas saying well historians think that this probably has a, a glimmer of the historical figure and this probably was invented later and then this one we're not really you know it's, it's just muddy right and there are certain people who tend to become you know the 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 adamant you know, and loudest voices, either for conservative Christianity or for atheist mythicism, that don't like that muddiness that is the nature of history, 
right? And the nature of, you know, science, right? Science and history, when we have enough evidence to work with, uh, things get clearer, right? As we work on them, right? As we dig literally and metaphorically deeper, uh, we, we find more and it allows us to say more and our conclusions get more and more secure, right? And yeah. so, yeah, the, the, another interesting parallel between the arguments on both sides are, you know, the people who say, you know, well, you know, why should I accept evolution? You know, scientists once thought the world was flat. And it's like, well, first of all, you know, by Columbus's time, they already knew, you know, it's like, there's so much myth and misinformation in that, you know, it's, oh, there's an issue. But then there are other people, uh, you know, who are on the other end of the spectrum, right, who will say, you know, well, you know, historians used to assume that, you know, the, the patriarch existed, right, and now they don't, and things like that. And, you know, that's, Historical study has progressed, right? As it's become more critical, as it's been become more open to multiple voices, as it's looked closely at the evidence. Uh, but that's not a parallel to, you know, the patriarchs are not a, a comparable case to Jesus because we don't have people writing about the patriarchs, you know, somebody like Abraham uh, within, you know, a couple of decades. And it's not the same kinds of stories and things like that. And even in the case of Abraham, you know, historians won't say, you know, we know that there's there was never ever a figure, right, behind that. You know, somebody is the ancestor of these people, right? And whether they completely fabricated stories or, you know, that's, you know, they're more likely to be agnostic and say, nothing in our sources allow us to say anything about the ancestor of the Israelites, right? Uh, they're not going to say dogmatically, yeah, well, this person was invented or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, of course, when it's the ancestor and the person, you know, there must be a person who had lots of descendants, then, you know, okay, somebody is their ancestor, right? And what their name was and what they were, you know, um, there can be a King David without their, you know, without any of the stories, you know, the, the David and Goliath story or anything else, you know, being true. Uh, again, there too, some like, you know, the whole Bathsheba incident, you know, seems like, you know, I don't think, you know, his supporters came up with this story. You know, it's like maybe there's a, you know, a glimmer of truth, but how much, you know, historians are not going to be confident about that. Yeah. And so it's this muddiness of history that I think people like to avoid when they can. You know, I, if there's one thing I hope this episode has done for everybody is to try and have a conversation and to try and not be so derogatory or being, so in a, making enemies of people who think differently than you on this issue. I mean, we have a Christian and we have an atheist on this talking. Like you and me are pals. I guarantee you if we met in person, we'd go eat a steak, have a blast, talk about the stuff all day long. And um, I don't see any reason to have like, all right, Dr. McGrath, I'm going to challenge you. I brought my mop. Are you ready to slide on the floor? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, uh, I do want people to maybe say okay look look challenge each other think of these things through really investigate it and come down to whatever conclusion makes the most sense if you think mythicism makes the most sense be a mythicist be a mythicist people who aren't drawing that conclusion that are taking a historical approach and they're not just doing it because their pastor said so you could tell they've done some research they're looking into this they're not dummies they're not idiots like this is not like, oh, you're an idiot if you don't think this. You think there's a Jesus? How stupid are you? Or vice versa. You think there's not? I don't think we should be going around saying things derogatorily. That's just my point. I do think, for me, after looking at it, what makes the most straightforward, simple explanation for me is the historical one. But guess what? When I sat in California with Richard Carrier and with Dennis McDonald, and like I had private talks with Richard. Richard never looked at me and went, oh, that's dumb. You really think that? No, he was like, okay, so you, th you think there's a historical Jesus. You think that makes more sense based on everything. Okay, cool. So, like we were cool. He had no yeah. problem with yeah. my position. So yeah. I think the internet has, you know, on the one hand, it's made for, you know, collaborations. I mean, we can do stuff like this, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you can disseminate, you know, reliable information. Uh, you can have scholarly collaboration across huge distances. Um, I mean, we did things with the Mandayan Book of John um, edition that, you know, couldn't have happened, you know, prior to this era, you know, of uh, communication and things like that. But also, you know, if you look at something like, you know, the exposing of the, the 
uh, Gospel of Jesus' Wife fragment as a forgery. Uh, that was, you know, a lot of that discussion happened, you know, very quickly and happened online, right? Uh, would have taken much longer, right, to go through the traditional peer review processes and things like that. And so the internet has contributed a lot to scholarship, but there is also, you know, we can all fall into this kind of culture that exists in, you know, so many places on the internet mm -hmm. where you just, you know, you insult and you just, you know, the rhetoric gets heated and people get, you know, really, really mean, right? Because it's easy to think this, you know, not think of another person, you know, as an actual person, as an actual human being, right? It's easier when you're sitting down over a steak uh, to, to have a good conversation about whatever the subject is, right? Even if you disagree. Robert is asking who would pay. I would pay, Robert. If we were going out to dinner, I would pay. Even though Dr. McGrath might be like, no, 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 let me, nah, stop it. I'll okay. mop the floor with you if you don't let me pay. <laughs> I, I, I hope that if you get Richard Carrier on uh, at some point in the near future uh, to like respond to me or something yes. like that, that you will do like an, a graphic to start the thing with, with him wiping the, mopping the floor with me. <laughs> I mean, you've got to do it, right? So, you know, you got to right, do the gotta, I got to try and like, I think what I'd like to do, and I'm such a try to mend relationships kind of person because I empathize with everybody and I try to understand from both views. I'd love to have conversation somehow be possible in the future between you guys. I'd love that if that was possible, but we'll, we'll see, we'll work on it. Abel Shavis is Bible, half the story, Quran, other equal reincarnation. I think everything equals reincarnation. Friend, everything it? is reincarnation, Abel, everything. Thank you so much. Rob Atheist Scriptures, the most honest interpretation of the current evidence seems to be agnosticism of Jesus historicity. Neither side has enough to win the issue as is. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, historically speaking, on probability, I guess you'd say we aren't certain. Right. But um Right. And that's that's one of the things, you know, one of the tactics of young earth creationists. Right. And let me clarify, that's why I made the comparison between mythicism, young earth creationism, uh, Holocaust denialism, climate change denialism, you know, anti-vaccinationism, all these things. Uh, it's not that these all have the same kind, like degree of evidence in favor of a particular conclusion. Right. If you are testing something in uh, the natural sciences, often you can draw much, you know, much more, uh, you know, draw conclusions with a much higher degree of confidence than you can anything in ancient history, right? What I'm saying is that the same tactics are used, right? And one of the things that's used all across the board is to say, well, there's room for doubt. Therefore, you know, it's it's uncertain or why not just go this route, right? And I think that, you know, the, the evidence, you know, when we take each piece, there are enough pieces of evidence where I think the direction of probability leans towards historicity enough that you know, I think it's it's not just an open question, right? Agnosticism for me would be like, yeah, I just don't know. I don't claim to know. It could be, might not be. And you know, that's not how I feel about it. I would right. say, you know, I feel like the, the the balance of probability in a particular direction. Um, and that's one reason why I you know disagree with you know some of the work carriers done trying to you know calculate probability. And you know I think that you know when it comes to history, Right. The fact that, you know, you, you, you find a story that says somebody had red hair and then turns out that there's reason to doubt they had red hair. That doesn't make it less likely that they existed. Mm -hmm. Right. Like each, you know, if you have a figure who, based on one piece of evidence, likely existed and everything else that's said about them either is uncertain or seems to have been made up, then you have a his figure who's likely to be historical about whom we know little or nothing else. Right. And so I think it's important, you know, to recognize that as part of the way that, you know, historical study works. Uh, you know, maybe it'll change, right? Historical study has not always followed the same methods and used, done things in exactly the same way you know, down, you know, across time. And so, yeah. yeah so I'm, I'm not with you on that. It's like people are like, aren't you an agnostic? By definition, yeah. I don't believe God exists by definition. Now, what I mean by God I'm going to refer to the typical, what I'm reading in the text, what I'm reading in the Bible and not use symbols to define it. Right. Okay. So I'm trying to get back to its original ancient yeah. Near Eastern context mm -hmm. and whatnot. Yeah. Now we might have more in common on that. Like you might go, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think, I think at best I'm interpreting these narratives with symbols. Okay, cool. So we have more in common there, 
but I'm not an agnostic. Like I'm sitting here, like, like doubting Thomas, just sitting in my room going, he might be, he might not be, he might be, he not, might not be like, I don't sit there and wonder. I, I, I believe unicorns don't exist. Yeah. I'm not saying they couldn't. I'm just saying, I believe they don't. So I would use that same to say, I believe there was probably a historical Jesus. Yeah. Now you might say uh, I would, should remain agnostic. That would be your conclusion. I'm just, I think it's more likely based on what I'm looking at. Anyways, Rob, thank you for the super chat. I got to give you a special shout out here. Look, you are wonderful. Dr. McGrath, you came on the channel where a lot of mythicists watch my material. And they're probably thinking, who is this guy? Who does he think he is over here talking about my mythical Jesus? Are you kidding me? Um, tell us about your books. You there? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm just muted because I wanted to see if I could find. Um, I know that you know, like ages ago I put together like a roundup uh, on my blog of all the blogging, like, or the, the highlights of blogging I had done on mythicism up until that point, which was like 10 years of blogging. And so I should, it's like, I should share oh, that. Do you have it? Yeah, yeah. sure. I'll... Yeah. Uh, I'll see if I can find it. But okay. in terms of, of my books, right. So I started out um, and I think I talked about this on another, you know, another, um, another episode. So on, in another conversation, so I won't go into too much detail, but uh, as you can see, I've branched out from, you know, study of early Christian uh, early Christianity and early Christian literature to do things about science fiction as well, um, become a definite, more than a side interest. Uh, but my main area is still uh, early Christianity and started out trying to figure out why the Gospel of John is so different from uh, the other Gospels. And so that's what my uh, doctoral work was on and was a lot of work on um, sort of John as apologetic or maybe a better term would be legitimation, right? That the author is defending uh, an exalted view of Jesus, and in the process is uh, drawing new connections and making making new arguments, and uh, the the belief system develops in the process. Mm. Uh, and so, conti have continued to keep going back to monotheism and Christology, but uh, branched out into historical Jesus work, and uh, have some articles that have been published on points related to that. Right? Um, does you know the 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 temple incident? the uh, the uh, connections between the passage that we looked at earlier in this conversation in Philippians and the story about the Garden of Gethsemane, things like that. <clears throat> and then recently, uh, what Jesus learned from women. And so that's, that's one that I really want to highlight uh, because Jesus learning things from people, like the way people influenced him, is not something that most historians, right, including people with a, you know, who, who don't have a a view of him as a divine figure, but still that has not been asked as regularly. When it has right. been asked, it's been asked about John the Baptist. And you know, I do think that Jesus was John's follower at one point. He was part of his movement, right? Uh, but because of this uh, penchant for, you know, this sort of male-centeredness of academia historically, uh, even when people dared to ask whether Jesus learned from John the Baptist, uh, whether he learned from other, you know, might he have learned from Hillel or somebody like that. Uh, they weren't asking, you know, what was the influence of women on him? And yet I saw in story after story that these encounters seem to be transformative for Jesus, right? And so I would recommend this book. Um, you know, they, some mythicists, definitely some mythicists will hate it, uh, but I think some might, you know, this if they haven't actually read like a full-fledged academic book, and this is one that tries to be accessible for general audience. Mm -hmm. And I, I use a lot of uh, sort of historical fiction and recognize that in trying to reconstruct, I am taking what we can say with confidence and trying to ask, what well, what would it mean to turn this into a, a reconstruction that is historically plausible, right? And so I'm daring to be creative and I recognize that. And that's what historians do when they take sources and turn them into story, right? Uh, it's it's what movies do, and you know it can be a biopic, a genuine you know sort of movie about a historical person right. uh, that's not completely fictional, but you know some persons or events may have been compressed, dramatized, things like that. Uh, but it really is an attempt to take seriously the human figure that we encounter in the Gospels, right? Who does learn things from people, 
right? He's not just somebody who comes in, knows everything, and tells everybody what's what. Uh, he is changed by his encounters, I think. Thank you so much for that. If you would get that link for me, I'm just going to plug your blog here. Um, so obviously religion professor, the blog of James F. McGrath, that's at pathos.com. It is in the description and you can search his blog. This has got what, a couple decades worth of blogs on here? Probably something like that. It's a lot. I know it's a lot. I'm not sure if you're muted or not, but I can't see you. Um, yeah. Any yeah. Sorry, do, do I disappear when I click to another tab? Um, no, no. Oh, okay. Yeah. Just making sure. You said, I thought you said I disappeared. Uh, no, I, I couldn't hear you, I think. Oh, I didn't okay. know if you yeah. were. Now, I'm going to see if I can find that. Um, I think the only way, because you know my blog moved a couple of times, and so the address changed, and so Google doesn't okay. really find the old posts. I'll just oh, plug the Patreon. Go join the Patreon. John Kloppenborg uh, mentioned something interesting in this interview. And he is doing the Christ associations right now and using a heuristic approach on other association groups in the first century. Can we, can we get at the historical Jesus? And this has been a question. I figure I'd open up the scab and just go ahead. Let's, let's go after the Jesus question. I will be having Richard Carrier. I'll make contact with him about possibly doing a follow-up show to address some of the questions and contentions that I may have and how he responds and then, of course, with the scholars that I've had on, maybe he can um, look into a few of their responses and come on and address it and defend his particular view. This is what we do at Myth Vision, and we let people make up their own minds in the audience. You think about it. You think what makes the most sense. Um, nobody's going to force you to yeah. think that way. Yeah. So I found, yeah, I found a post from 2011. Um, it was because there was something else that was, um, I think, had previously tried to do a roundup, and then it left out a few things. And so this links to that earlier roundup. And this is from 2011, uh -huh. right? And you'll see if you, um, you know, click click on one of the links in there. I can't remember which one it is. Uh, uh, these are all links. Oh wow! Yeah, so one some, of the topics I've been. You got hyperlinks here. Yeah, a roundup of my earlier blogging on the subject. Is that what I need? Yeah, so the mythicism roundups, that's the May 14th uh, one, has some of the things. But as you'll see, the, the, I've got posts on there. If you if you click on the like the, the keyword or, uh -huh. or search on the blog, I mean, I've been blogging about this for uh, more than a decade. So you've already, you, you're well aware of Earl Doherty's works. You've already read all that. You're aware of his material. Yeah, started going through it chapter by chapter and eventually was like, uh, you know, just, it, you know, I mean, people often ask, you know, both in support of, you know, the anti-evolutionism and in support of mythicism and support of various other things, you know, well, you know, why don't you spend more time writing about this? Like, because, you know, if, if you're not persuaded by something, if you read it, you don't find it persuasive, spending time going through point by point, especially when the response is often just, you know, rhetorical things trying to you know, score points, at, you know, using debating tactics, but not actually getting at the substance. Mm. It's, you know, it's, it's time consuming. And I'd rather actually be doing something that I think will make a contribution to the quest for the historical Jesus. And I'm hoping that my next pro big project, which is about the historical figure of John the Baptist, uh, will, will do that, right? Because it's focusing on John in his own right. Mm. I just posted the link in the chat. So everybody who's interested in reading this on your blog, it is in the live chat right now. And um, you may want to check that out. In fact, I need to add that to the description of the video. So if you're watching this yeah. later, you can actually see, go read this material if you're interested in hearing what's been going on back and forth. Um, but they can search like Richard Carrier, Earl Doherty, um, you know, Neil Godfrey. Um, oh, so you yeah. do all of it. All, wow. Yeah, you know, everyone, you know, Acaria S stuff is on there, I think. You really have an interest in this topic. Actually. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll, I can tell you what happened. Uh, you know, first of all, it was engaging with people and finding some, you know, you know, really interesting ideas on some people's blogs. But then they occasionally throw in this thing that was, I was like, wait, what? You know, but even before that, I actually had a colleague. Uh, I won't say say more about who it was because that would probably be inappropriate. Uh, I don't have their permission to do so. But uh, sat in on my class, like was genuinely interested in this, and was an atheist who had read 
like atheist press stuff. And so some of the like, you know, going back, you know, a, a decade or two, you know, kind of Jesus mythicist stuff. Uh, this would have been, you know, early 2000s at some point, probably. And so there was all this stuff, which I hadn't come across before because it's not mainstream, right? It's not published by a mainstream academic publisher, uh, not, you know, not mainstream academic authors, things like that. And, and he was influenced by that, but he came in with curiosity and he eventually shared some of these things with me, but he actually changed his mind just by taking my class, uh, not because I was arguing against mythicism because I hadn't encountered it up to that point. You know, I was just discussing the evidence and we were working through the methods and doing all that stuff. And so that was my introduction to it. And I was fascinated. Uh, mm. I also am fascinated because, you know, one thing that I think a lot of, you know, like mythicists in the English speaking world don't know is that this was a really popular view in like the communist bloc countries, right? And so I came across, when I lived in Romania, I came across, you know, Romanian textbooks, like, you know, religion textbooks from the, the communist era. And I was like, wow, that's really interesting because they they restricted what you could publish about religion. And it was, you know, Jesus mythicist stuff in Romania. Um, and it's fascinating, right? And so this was, you know, this was propaganda of an atheist regime, right? Mm. And so, you know, I think it's something that needs to be, you know, uh, considered through all these lenses. Um, that's not the origin of mythicism by any means, but it certainly did experience, um, you know, a heyday in that context. Uh, but so, you know, between knowing people who are mythicists, uh, having people change their mind as a result of studying, you know, in a mainstream academic context, you know, that's not religiously affiliated, neither hostile to atheism nor uh, favorable to it, not either hostile to Christianity nor favorable to it, just trying to look at the evidence and, and do the scholarship well and, you know, disagree in respectful and, you know, productive ways. Uh, that that really got me started. But then, you know, people were really eager to debate and discuss things with me. And so I explained where I disagreed with them. And that's when it really kind of the blogging thing really just <laughs> snowballed. Wow. Well, thank you. I really appreciate you giving us your time. I did have one more that someone super chatted last second. Is an archangel as the Messiah and dying for your sins in the lower heavens plausible for Second Temple Jews to come up with and have it catch on? I mean, I would say that... The, the thing that always can, can always be said is, you know, people believe weird things, you know, and I think mythicism, you know, at least certainly some versions of it are, are, are very weird. Some of them are, I mean, I actually, you know, have you know, got most respect for, I just think they're wrong, right? And, you know, but I think there are attempts to make, make as good a case as one can for them. Uh, so people can invent all kinds of things. And they say in, you know, in lots of academic fields that, you know, if, if, if a, if a, a theory or a view or a proposal can explain everything, then it doesn't explain anything. And so the, you know, well, they could have all just made it all up, right? The historian has to ask, okay, but does that seem to be, you know, does the evidence look like they just made it all up, right? Because we have examples of things where we're pretty sure they made it all up. And what does it look like? And is this different in some ways? Is it, mm. they're making up a lot of stuff, but there's also stuff that they're uncomfortable with, but they can't you know, completely fabricate away because other people know it and want answers, you know. So I think, you know, one of the big problems I have is that, you know, if you invent, you know, I mean, first of all, why invent a, a Messiah, certainly a Davidic Messiah who dies for your sins? You know, it's like, why, right? I mean, have, you know, I mean, you could have an archangel who sacrifices for humanity in and you know, maybe offers himself in the celestial temple or something like that. But it's not clear that anybody was looking for that. You know, know that anybody wanted that and would have found that you know something that was meaningful for them. Uh, they wanted messiahs, right? They wanted the restoration of anointed ones, the kingship, the priesthood, you know, the high priesthood to the rightful holders of those roles, and they wanted sacrifice for sins. And certainly, there were. Uh, stories about martyrs dying faithfully for God. And the early Christians drew on some of those things. Uh, you know, they wanted God to turn back wrath and so wanted atonement. But, you know, the configuration that we get in the case of Jesus looks a lot more like a human figure who, whose followers thought he was the Messiah, was executed, and they are finding theological ways of making sense of his death. Right. The early Christian evidence looks much more like that to me than what somebody would have come up with if they were inventing 
um, an archangel messiah dying for your sins, right? And he's got an ordinary name, right? English speakers don't always recognize this, but you know, Jesus is not, you know, and um, Chris Hansen has a, an article out just about this, um, touching on this. Um, you know, Jesus is a celestial figure, right? You don't get angels named Jesus, right? I mean, it's the name Joshua, right? It just comes through Greek into English as Jesus, right? But it's it's the name Joshua, and it was a common human name, right? It's not like Raphael and other things, right? Uh, you have to, and of course, if if you're not aware of it, you have to go back before, you know, there were Ninja Turtles, right? In order to understand, you know, some of the, you know, the, the names and what their connotations were. And so, yeah, so I, people could make up all sorts of things, but I don't see any reason to think that anyone did, and I'm not sure why they would have. For this Thank particular you. Scenario. Hey, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Grace, yeah. for the super chat. This has been wonderful. I always yeah. enjoy your time. It was a pleasure. I hope everybody gets a book, goes to the uh, blog and subscribes so you can get notified every time he drops a new one in your email. So definitely go subscribe to his blog. And uh, any final words from you as we leave? No, uh, just if you're if you're if you're hesitant to uh, you know, splurge on one of my books when you're like, yeah, I'm still not convinced. Yeah. I see your, your public library might have it, right? You know, check it out. Um, but read something on this subject, right? Because just like with any academic field, you know, whether it's in the sciences, whether it's in history, it's it's in the kind of books and the, the serious scholarly things, right? Don't just read stuff that's written for a popular audience, right? Because, I mean, the case for evolution, for instance, is made in those detailed studies. And if I try reading them, I'm out of my depth. But, you know, reading a book that tries to get into some of the details will, you know, give me a better sense of what the case is. Uh, read something that gives that kind of detailed attention to the historical Jesus, whether it's by me or by someone else, and whether you buy a copy or get it from your public library. There's plenty of stuff out there. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Don't forget, we are Myth Fishing. Don't any of you have the guts to play for blood? I'm your huckleberry. That's just my game.